Hi, everyone, and welcome to yet another special edition House Call video conference interview as part of our ACC 2020 coverage. I'm Kevin Kunzman, Managing Editor of HCP Live, and today I'm joined by Dr. David Cohen, a corresponding author of the study we're going to be talking about today and a professor of medicine at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, Dr. Cohen's study, uh, The Conscious Sedation versus General Anesthesia for uh, TAVR replacement, results of an instrumental variable analysis, uh, was published last week as part of the ACC's uh, meeting agenda. And just before the meeting kicks off virtually in a couple of days, we're sitting down with Dr. Cohen um, across screens to talk a little bit about the findings and the impact it has on the field. So Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So um, maybe if we could start off, I mean, we've already had a few, um, you know, long form discussions about exactly um, what TAVR looks like in 2020, how it's evolved in the last couple of decades, and um, sort of the refinements we need to make as we go forward and continue to um, better this practice. Can you tell us a little bit about the basis of your study? Absolutely. So, so TAVR has been around for uh, the better part of a decade, actually longer than a decade, uh, um, investigationally, and then um, uh, for about nine years in the United States. And when TAVR first started, it was a procedure that was done exclusively under general anesthesia. There was surgery involved, uh, cutting down in the femoral artery or going through the chest, um, and general anesthesia was an intrinsic part of it, along with uh, all of the other accompaniments. Uh, and then as, the, as we got more experience, um, as the device became more refined, as we, as we uh, uh, um, extended it in practice, um, people started to do it with conscious sedation, with uh, patients being more awake, maybe not entirely awake, but not intubated. Um, that really is the distinction between general anesthesia and conscious sedation. And over the years, um, it has uh, progressed and more and more sites and more and more patients are being treated this way. There have been several um, studies over the last six or seven years that have looked at the question of whether patients are being harmed because when conscious sedation was first started, people were concerned. Perhaps patients were being harmed by that. Uh, there, uh, only one small randomized study was done, which really was underpowered and couldn't look at this. So we decided to take a, a new look, uh, a fresh look at this question using data uh, from the United States. Uh, it's the largest study to date uh, and uh, uses some, uh, some rather sophisticated new methodologies uh, for trying to really get a good, uh, a good grasp on the answer as to whether conscious sedation or general anesthesia should be preferred. Can you tell us a little bit more about the patient population observed? What was the size of it? What were the demographics? Right. So the, the study was based on the TBT registry, which is our national registry here in the United States that collects data on virtually all TAVR procedures. Um, we collected data. Um, from uh, late, it's actually from early 2016 uh, through early 2019, so a little over a three-year study period, and included a whole total of 120,000 patients undergoing TAVR, the largest study by far uh, of this question, all of whom were being done by transfemoral access through the leg, um, using a percutaneous method, which is, again, the most common method that's used in about 90-plus percent uh, of TAVR patients uh, today. So it was really an all-comers population, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk. The only patients who were excluded were patients really who required alternative access, um, meaning uh, you know, through the chest or through the neck or through the shoulder uh, type of access, or patients who were having the procedure done emergently. It's, it's good to have that distinction, I would assume. And um, are there any other risks that those patients may face? And that's why you know, you know, they would have been excluded. Yes, that's, I mean, again, I think it's the patients who are having alternative access generally are not eligible for conscious sedation, so that's why we excluded them. And the same thing for patients with uh, um, who are being done emergently. So we didn't want, we really wanted to focus on a, uh, first of all, the vast majority of patients who are being treated uh, and the patients for whom this, this technique is most suited. Right, of course. And uh, how exactly did you gauge the endpoint? What, what did you use as metrics to uh, gauge these two? Right. So again, because we have the TBT registry, we're restricted to looking at endpoints that are assessed uh, in the TBT registry. The main endpoint of our study was in hospital mortality. That's a pretty easy one to assess. It's very reliable. Um, and it's obviously a very important endpoint to our patients. We also looked at a number of other patient-centered outcomes. Uh, uh, things including whether they were discharged uh, to home. We looked at 30-day mortality. Um, and uh, we also looked at something we call a falsification endpoint. Um, and that type of endpoint is one that we would not expect to be affected by uh, the type of the anesthesia. That was whether the patient had a vascular complication or not. Um, so the idea of including that in our study is because it was an observational 
and not a randomized trial, we wanted to have a check to see if we had done a good job uh, in getting rid of confounding or bias. Sounds like a good combination of quality of life outcomes, mortality, and overall efficacy of procedure. So we, did, we also looked at, at procedural success, so exactly all of those different components. Excellent. And what were the findings? Finding, there were several different findings. So the first finding um, was that conscious sedation is increasing in the United States. So over the three years that we studied, uh, the use of conscious sedation on a per patient basis increased uh, from about one third of all patients to almost two thirds of patients. So there was a substantial increase, but you can still see that, you know, again, a third of patients, even in the most recent iteration with current valves and uh, with current techniques are still not getting conscious sedation. At, and you know, one of the really interesting things was there was tremendous variation at the site level. So there we divided the, the hospitalizations into different quartiles, four different groups. The lowest quartile of hospitals in the country um, used conscious sedation on average never. Um, 0% median conscious sedation use compared to the highest quartile, 92%. So what you can see, and really what formed the basis of our study, uh, is that uh, the type of hospital a patient went to, which particular hospital they went to, has a much more profound influence on whether they get conscious sedation or general anesthesia than anything about the patient. In fact, it's almost a random event um, at the patient level what type of anesthesia they get. If you go to a hospital that likes to use conscious sedation, you get conscious sedation almost, you know, almost invariably. And if you go to a hospital that does not use conscious sedation, you almost never get it. Um, and so that actually is the foundation of our study because that's what we call a natural experiment. That means you know patients don't generally choose which hospital they're going to very you know meaningfully on the basis of the type of anesthesia. They go where their doctor refers them. They go what is geographically appropriate, where their cardiologist is. Um, but they don't generally choose a hospital based on the anesthesia. If you have this natural experiment, then we can take advantage of that variability in sites to study what is the effect of conscious sedation. That's really fascinating. And, um, you know, if it's something that's random based on the patient um, speaking facility to facility, is this uh, a, a resourcing matter? Is this a supply matter? Or is this just a preference? My sense from talking to colleagues around the country and from other, other things just like this is a preference. Um, again, sometimes it has to do with workflows and things like that, um, in, you know, in the different hospitals, availability of anesthesiology, other sorts of things. Um, but a lot of it is preference. And the reason why it's preference is because there isn't clear data on which is better. So when there's not clear data, a lot of times physician preference or hospital preference uh, will dominate that decision. If there was strong data from a big randomized trial that said one way or the other, then we would expect there to be much more consensus. But here it really is you know, almost a, a, a random event. In terms of the outcomes, uh, what we saw was very, you know, very interesting. What we saw was that in general, conscious sedation was a better technique for the patients. It resulted in lower in-hospital mortality, lower 30-day mortality, higher rates of discharge to home, and no difference in procedural success. Uh, and then again, very importantly, we checked to this falsification endpoint, and the falsification endpoint of vascular complications was no different as well. So we are fairly confident. It's not a, you know, it's not a randomized trial, but it's probably the next best thing uh, to that, that we have balanced the patient groups uh, and when we do that, we see that conscious sedation patients do better on average. The other factor that was better um, with, the, uh, with conscious sedation was length of stay. The length of stay was about 0.8 of a day shorter in the patients who were treated with conscious sedation as compared to general anesthesia. And that matters, obviously, to patients who would like to go home quickly, but it also matters to hospitals who would like to save money um, by shortening the length of stay. So it was really, you know, to, to us, it was a, you know, a strong a strong win for conscious sedation. How do we imagine this is going to uh, feed into our overall practice? Do you imagine this influencing or affecting in some kind of way guide, guidance uh, from institutions? Or I mean, I hope that it will influence practice. Obviously, there are changes in practice that are already ongoing, um, as, as uh, we discussed. And I think, you know, I, my hope is that this information, first of all, will embolden the sites that are already doing conscious sedation if they're not doing it in virtually all their patients to continue to increase the rates that they're doing it. But I also hope, you know, very importantly, that this information can bring along the sites that are doing it almost never to start really ramping up. Because again, there doesn't seem to be any downside to the patient. It's only upside with respect to outcomes. 
it's upside for the hospital with respect to costs, and everybody's concerned about costs these days. So this is a rare win-win, in my view, uh, for you know, uh, for for both patients and hospitals.